we have about 25 minutes. There's been, I think, a, a consistency in the presentations you've heard, so um, uh, that, that we do face a, uh, an urgent and huge problem, that, that whether uh, there are, are absolute uh, limits to growth uh, can be debated, but, but I think as Bill said, does it really matter? Are you prepared to take that, uh, that chance? Unlike a financial crisis we've just gone through, uh, which can be repaired, uh, if we get this one wrong, uh, it can't be repaired uh, in, in, in a year or two. Uh, do we know, I mean, one of Jim's charts show a number of instruments we know already. Uh, they're messy. Uh, there's not agreement on them. Do we, do, do we know? Uh, how do we get the political space, uh, both within countries and, and collectively, uh, because this is not something which I think was said that one country can do alone. So what I'm going to do is, is, is open it up, I think, to, to, uh, to questions. Uh, and, uh, and let's see, and then we'll give the, the panel uh, just at, at the very end a chance to, uh, to make any concluding comments. See, here, please. I can see the problem previous uh, moderators had trying to uh, audio see his hands going up. Uh, Sony Kapoor from uh, Redefine. Uh, well, just taking the last point you said about the good enough and relating it back to what Jim started with in terms of the need for a wholesale uh, change in the system of financial incentives and savings, etc. I think uh, given the very depressing picture you have painted in terms of how badly we're over our environmental budget, this has some important lessons. What we are seeing instead of the massive whole scale changes needed and recognition of the scale is even things that are on basic economic metrics, very sensible, positive IRR projects that any bank would be ready to fund. Many of those low-hanging free dollar bills lying on the floor are not being funded. And we're not talking about small amounts of money here. We're talking about fairly substantial uh, profitability. We're talking about fairly substantial uh, sums of money. And those investment opportunities are not being taken, talking narrowly about the question of, uh, of carbon and green investment. And before we get to, I mean, it's, it's not, we don't have to go in sequence, but before we get to those bigger questions of how to live within our carbon budgets and the green budgets, etc., it's important to us that if we cannot even, if we have an economic and a financial structure which doesn't even finance the things that it is supposed to, it's free money lying on the ground, how are we going to get to that ambitious stage to actually save ourselves from near certain deaths and the second law of thermodynamics? And it's important to look at these questions. So we have started a project called Building a Green Financial System. We have been looking at the kind of perversions, both micro and macro, that act as an obstacle in some why some of these investments don't happen. And we've been uh, working with the European Greens and the European policymakers. And I think looking at basic concepts like carbon stress tests, having fiduciary responsibilities, having different accounting standards, which also penalize the volatility of fossil fuels, for example, which, which just doesn't get into the current discussion. So there's a whole set of measures that now is the right time to be talking about while the dossiers on financial regulation are open, where we can make tweaks to the asset side of things, to the credit providers, as well as to financial investors, which can at least start reaping the low-hanging fruit and move towards actually the more challenging questions of when we get to trade-offs between economic growth and environmental issues. So I just wanted to say, you know, we, it, we need to recognize that this is the basic first step we need to take. Okay, thanks. In, in the back, I think, was, I'm sorry, I can't see faces, but. Uh, Thank you, John Chisholm. I'm reminded of the Club of Rome study in the early 70s by Jay Forrester at MIT, which famously predicted that we would run out of uh, energy and food in the next 25 years. What the study, of course, overlooked or could not anticipate was all of the innovation and entrepreneurship that would happen in the next 25 years that discovered new ways of getting more out of every uh, 
a barrel of oil and and a bit of shale and uh, new enhancements in food productivity. How does that whole experience inform your thinking? Okay, I'm going to take one more question and then I'm going to turn it to the panel to uh, David Reynolds. Well, it seems to it seems to me one of the I'm David Reynolds from CG. Uh, it seems to me one of the things we do need to be thinking about is how we at least begin by stopping sending the wrong signals in a conventional economic sense. The, my previous institution, we did a good deal of work on subsidy reform, and we discovered with a bit of a back of the envelope calculation that there are probably about a billion dollars a year worth of subsidies in the current system, both to agriculture and to fossil fuels. It's about a trillion dollars. It's not a billion dollars, sorry. What's a billion? It's a trillion, and have missed up a few zeros. But it's about a trillion dollars a year, which is sending absolutely the wrong signals back through the economic system. They're largely ecologically perverse. Uh, they're, they're pushing the playing field in such a direction that renewable energy and alternatives don't get a chance. Uh, and they're also, to a certain extent, responsible for the food security problem we have at the moment. So if we don't do anything else, at least scrub out of the current system those sorts of signals we're sending on a quite regular basis to do the wrong thing. Thanks. Okay, so let me turn to the panel. I mean, low-hanging fruit, uh, getting rid of subsidies, question of Club of Rome and, and innovation and technology. Bill, you said you wanted to kick off. Well, I, I have a number of comments, uh, perhaps, to each of the questions. Uh, first of all, one of our other myths is that humans are rational. We, we don't behave rationally. And I, I had a slide up here I had to skip through to explain a little bit of that. I'd recommend all of you take a look at a little book called Brain and Culture, which is an attempt to pull together some of the recent cognitive science that shows how human beings, in the course of uh, growing up, acquire the beliefs, values, and assumptions of their culture. Uh, they acquire certain ideological or religious perspectives and points of view. And that over a period of 15 to 20 years, this literally shapes the synaptic circuitry of the brain, which helps to determine how they filter any uh, subsequent information. And we tend to avoid negative things, data that flies in the face of our fixed ways of doing things, and we tend to seek out experiences that reinforce our current understanding and knowledge. It's an extremely important book, and uh, the, the whole area of cognitive sciences in terms of uh, showing how we literally have an, a system that was adaptive in pre-industrial times because it, it made some sense to acquire the habitual uh, habits of a culture that was surviving. We're in a situation now, though, where we need very rapid change, and we're inhibited by our own biological uh, system from responding to it. As for the Club of Rome, that's probably the most trashed and least read volume that has ever been published in the, in the 20th century. I, I recommend all of you go online, go to the CSIRO Australia, look for Turner, and a, it's a report uh, published two years ago on the 30-year history following publication of the Club of Rome report. And what it shows is that in that 30-year time, their model has practically tracked everything to a T. They did not say we'd be out of everything by the end of the 20th century, as many people think. They said within the first few decades of the 21st century, we'd have a population peak, we'd have an energy problem, we've had major pollution problems, and they're dead on in those kinds of projections. Limits to growth is still with us. It's still a valuable document. As primitive as it was, they happened to luck out so that current trends have uh, substantiated much of what they have said. And David's absolutely right about the wrong signals. We are hypocrites in, in the greatest degree, because particularly in North America, we talk about being part of a market-based economy, and yet we do everything possible to subvert that economy with inappropriate subsidies to agriculture, to the fossil fuel sector, uh, and just about every other wrong thing about economics. I've never understood why all professional economists aren't up on their hind legs daily railing against our inability to internalize some of the basic externalities to make the market work as it, you know, it, it, the general theory, the theory of general equilibrium requires prices tell the truth. 
Now, you can't talk about having a market economy and spreading it around the world while doing everything you can to subvert the fundamental assumptions that make the general equilibrium model work. So, David, if we were to simply become less hypocritical and actually have a market economy, we'd be one hell of a lot better off. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I think uh, Bill has pretty comprehensively answered those questions. Just, just coming back to Sonia's point about um, why is it that people don't pick up the dollar bills from the floor. I mean, you can basically get people to do things in three ways. Either you coerce them, you convince them, or you persuade them to transact. And I think sometimes, you know, the business of transacting is too complicated, so you just have to tell them. And so for things like light bulbs in Europe, as we were discussing earlier, I think it's just easier to say, that's the rule, do it. Just Alex, one you. Other, sure. one other, I'm sorry, Alex. Well, I was just going to come back on the limits to growth point. Um, what always intrigues me about the limits to growth argument is suppose we all agreed that there were limits to economic growth. What would that mean in practice? What would we do the next day in policy terms? Do you initiate a planned recession? Do you abolish lending at interest? I mean, what are the actual practical implications? Um, what I'm getting at is that it seems to me that we're not clear on the policy agenda that would come with saying, yes, there are limits to growth. We know the politics of the issue are absolutely horrendous. And even if we did halt growth tomorrow, we'd still have a huge task to decouple uh, environmental impact from the economy at the size it is now. We have a huge decarbonization task uh, and so on. So it seems to me that although I absolutely accept that there may be limits to growth, we're starting at the very hardest end of the argument if we use that as the front end of our policy agenda. So I think in a way, I mean, I agree with Jim. I'm a skeptic on incrementalism and whether baby steps are going to get us where we need to get to. I think we do need to start by quantifying safe limits on some of these resources, starting with the climate and then looking at others. But I think starting with limits to growth per se um, is too much of a mouthful at once, and we should start with decoupling and then see where we are in 10 years if we've been serious about it. Okay, we've got a little just over 10 minutes, so I'm going to ask people to be as brief as they can. Uh, Ian first and then over the front. Thank you. Ian Golden, Oxford. Um, I'm a little bit concerned with the idea that I think I heard Alex and Camilla uh, promoting, which is we need a crisis, and then after that we need the ideas that will be picked up to change things for a number of reasons. I mean, it's very seductive sitting here at Preston Woods, because obviously that was a great story of something very constructive coming out of a crisis. Uh, but I would suggest that we're in a crisis, uh, and also um, that there's no evidence that big crises lead to change, and the financial crisis is the most evident recent example of that. Uh, and trade, of course, is another one. There's plenty of great trade theory around uh, that tells us about perverse subsidies, and everyone knows uh, about ag subsidies and everything else, and that's widely shared across economics, uh, neoclassical and other. Um, and it doesn't seem to have led to a removal of the blockages to, for example, the Doha round. So I'm, I don't understand the transmission between a crisis and change, why one assumes that if there's theory lying around, it will happen. Um, I also think that uh, it's a dangerous approach to assume that we're going to need to see a crisis. So I would look more towards embedding more work in the areas around the political economy of reform, lobby groups, media, and many other ways in which we can escalate what we already know and get a very strong transmission from a small crisis and hopefully uh, be proactive rather than reactive given the absolute tragedies in human lives and in ecological lives uh, that crises create. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Here and then. Um, Dennis Keller from Benham Markets in Washington. I wanted to pick up on Jim's fourth question, which is areas of research for the future, and take his first chart in the green box and tie it to both what Ian just said and what Alex said at the end. And I'm a little shocked that I'm going to do this, but I think one of the most important things said this weekend um, was your quote of Milton Friedman. Um, and that is to say, when crises happen, you look around for the ideas laying around. And Ian and I disagree. It's not looking around for the theory. The theory doesn't help during crisis. Um, I was a senior staffer in the Senate in September of 08, and Bernanke and um, Paulson come up and they say, this is our plan, and three days later we get a three-page bill. But right away, the Democratic leadership put out the calls. Rob Johnson got the call, George, Paul, um, Joe, a bunch of people got the call about what to do. This is the plan, and this is what they're saying we have to do. 
Um, and there were really no plans laying around for a crisis of the magnitude of the type. And it is true, as Gordon Brown said, there was, gain there was a bunch of fair amount of war gaming, so to speak, on financial crisis. But they were isolated, and they lacked what ultimately was the imagination to look broadly at things. People did not anticipate, and I see Lord Tanner Turner shaking his head, and it's exactly right. People were saying, well, we worried about this one failing or this one failing. Nobody worried about dominoes and contagion. So my, what I would say in terms of future research is people have to think about the unimaginable and they have to do research on the unimaginable that will happen in a crisis. So rather than figuring out incrementally, which I shouldn't say that, much research has to be done on incrementally getting to the green box, right? But you have to also have research, concrete research, so that a year from now, if there's a crisis that requires concrete ideas, that we could use them to move us to the green box instead of, as Ian just said, away from that, which is what happened in the financial crisis. The only idea on the table was Paulson's. The only marginal change at the time was, rather than just taking toxic assets off bank balance sheet and put them on the U.S. balance sheet, as we put in that bill finally when it passed, uh, the authorization to inject actual liquidity into the banks directly in exchange for equity. And that was actually the big innovation at the time. But the call went out, far, and Rob knows this, far and wide for ideas, to cap to everywhere, and there just was nothing on the shelf. There was no real crisis planning. And to the extent there was crisis planning, it lacked imagination. And that's what we need research. In addition to how we move along the theory, we need research of exactly what to do when the crisis happens, when it's least expected. You don't need a theory. You need a damn good plan. OK, thank you. Standing up there. And then to the front. Hey, thank you. I, I'm Jean-Paul Fiducy. <laughs> um, I want to make sure that I have understood. <laughs> I think that uh, uh, Jim has uh, beautifully set the, the scene. Uh, but you, when we are saying that there is a limit to growth, what do we mean? Do we mean that there is a limit to production? It's not only the fact that growth will stop, that will solve the problem. Because as far as we keep the production at the level it is now, we will have problems. So anyway, uh, unless we say that we, we should uh, uh, reduce the production by 50% or uh, go asymptotically toward uh, a zero production, we will not resolve the problem. That means that uh, if we take the entropy view of uh, uh, the ecosphere, a la Georges Kourlougan, <coughs> that uh, uh, means that we will have a, a disparate co conclusion. But we can also take the view that we, it exists two time arrow, say the entropy and the accumulation of knowledge. And we, we, we need to take into account both if we want to resolve the problem because <laughs> zero growth, uh, zero growth proposal will not do uh, by, by itself. The sustainability question is just about <laughs> delivering to the next generation the, uh, an amount of capital at least equal to the one we have inherited from the past. But by capital, we are speaking at the, in a broad sense. We are meaning economic capital, but human capital, and environmental uh, capital. So, I mean, we have to recognize that at the present, uh, we, there is limit to, to growth, and there is also limit to our knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. One more here in the front, and then we'll turn the panel. Thank you. This is um, a very short uh, proposition. Uh, in, uh, I think, as uh, Professor Rees, in your uh, presentation, you used uh, in the connection with the second law of thermodynamics that uh, neoliberal economics were pitching against that law. <laughs> 
I just wanted to be there and make the proposition that to rethink whether we really use the neoliberal expression here. The neoliberals was a word invented in 1932 in the Colloque Lippmann in Paris when economics, uh, economists got together very much concerned about the emergence of fascism, Nazism, and communism in Europe. And they were rethinking whether the market ideas were the right and they needed a, a sort of a stronger state uh, other than maybe some people you had in mind with using the word. And it was Rusto in particular and Röpke and Hayek and these people who created the word of the neoliberalism. So I think we, in honor of those people, we should think about whether we really use the word in that context. I know it's a political catchword today, but it has nothing to do with the history of economic thought. Okay, Camilla. Well, let me, let me pick up on the question that Ian posed around crisis. I mean, I think there's, there's crisis and crisis. I'm very struck by what happened in 2007-8 around the what happened to the price of food, commodities, oil, and a whole range of other things. And the galvanizing impact that that food price spike had on people's interest in the agricultural sector um, and in all of the resources that go into that and the need to make sure that those resources are combined in ways that are a lot more effective than they have been in the past. So the, you know, the last thing I want is some humongous crisis in which many people suffer appallingly. But I think that a shock like that of the um, 0708 um, price index can be enormously helpful in terms of the shock waves that then spread out to a whole range of different governments, research sectors, companies, and so on. I mean, with a whole set of quite um, perverse impacts as well, when you start looking at the, um, the kind of the, the land grab phenomenon that we're, we're also seeing, so. Perhaps I'll answer the, uh, or at least attempt to address the whole question again of the limits and what I meant by it. What I meant was that, that there are strict limits to the maximum throughput of energy and material in the ecosphere. And the human system is part of the ecosphere. If you looked at that upward ticking slide showing carbon dioxide accumulations in the atmosphere, that's an output from the human economy into the host system, the ecosphere. Both are complex systems. And if you have a variable uh, such as greenhouse gases increasing indefinitely, it's a driving variable for the climate system. There is a strong possibility that at some point you reach a tipping point where the climate system becomes destabilized and enters into a very different regime from the one that has in fact spawned civilization. The climate system is too big to fail. No bank on the planet is too big to fail in comparison. It will take us all down should that occur. That's what I meant by the limits to growth. If you think of a steady state, it needn't be a horrific concept. Look at a verdant tropical ecosystem. It's a steady state. It's not growing. It has enormous numbers of species, the highest diversity and resilience of systems on the planet in many respects, and yet it is a steady state. A steady state human economy could be very similar. It doesn't mean a static state. It can mean a, a system in which new technologies, Jim Valley's uh, Blackberry, it could rocket while others are going down. Maybe it's time to phase out the private automobile as a gas consuming uh, hostile entity in our cities. So a, a steady state can be an exceedingly dynamic and exciting place to be. Uh, particularly if, it one, if it's one that leads to your survival, which leads me to my last point. The current state is a status quo that is leading us, I think by general agreement, to a hellhole. It will precipitate collapse of some kind or other. We're seeing it daily in fishery statistics. The oceans are acidifying. Uh, dead zones are increasing. Deforestation proceeds apace. Climate is changing. That's the status quo. 
if we proceed in that direction, it should be easy for a group as intelligent as this to anticipate a scenario that is truly disastrous. What I'm proposing instead is a hopeful scenario in which there is opportunity galore uh, for thoughtful people to create a new social system and economic system that sustains, refreshes life for all of us in a world that will continue to produce the wherewithal by which to maintain the human system, which gets to that questioner's last point. There is a criterion in ecological economics called the, the constant capital stocks criterion for sustainability. There's a strong version of it which says that we should pass from one generation to next, to use the language of the questioner, uh, a, a comparable adequate stock of capital assets. Now, mainstream economics says it's okay if the value of the assets is transferred from one generation to the next. But that means, as, well, for example, bluefin tuna sold in Tokyo a couple of weeks ago for $300,000. That means that the stock can be declining even as its income or the income generated from it or the absolute value of the stock rises. But you're destroying the physical capital upon which that value rests. This is insane. What we need is a constant physical stock of bluefin tuna and other aspects of the biophysical assets of the planet which are necessary to sustain future human abundance. What we're doing today, listen, in a thermodynamic system in which one system is a parasite on the other, the growth and, and, and accretion of mass in the human system is literally at the expense of the d destruction of the mother system. That's what we're doing, converting the earth into the human system. And at some point, the fundamental life support services provided by nature, such as stable climate, clean waters, and biomass, soil, and so on, will be so undermined as to be incapable of sustaining that now uh, super aggrandized stock of human beings. We need to reestablish equilibrium of the human system within the systems dynamics of the ecosphere. And the systems dynamics of the ecosphere are steady state dynamics. Get used to it. Thank you. Alex? I'm just going to pick up briefly on Ian's point about crisis. Um, I spent longer than is probably healthy hanging out in UN climate talks, where process is absolutely glacial progress in that process. And so the people that that process produces are hyper-incrementalists. They've all been through the agony of trying to get Kyoto into force, and so they naturally assume that this is how progress happens, one tiny step at a time. Now, imagine you had a climate equivalent of Lehman Brothers, not a global crash, but certainly some sort of climate impact that makes everyone sit bolt upright. The question I'm interested in was, is would we be ready to take advantage of the political window of opportunity that would open up suddenly and quite briefly afterwards? I've put this question to chief climate negotiators from countries, and the answer, without exception, is no. It doesn't really occur to them to sort of have ideas sitting on the shelf that are much more radical than anything that gets talked about in the process at the moment that could be dusted off and put into practice very quickly. I'm certainly not saying we should do nothing in the meantime, but I think it's these opportunities where uh, the big potential lies. And just to come back to your suggestion that, this isn't, that crisis doesn't lead to change, I think it's the only thing that leads to change in global governance, whether you're looking at the Second World War leading to the UN and the Bretton Woods system, or the 30 years war leading to the peace of Westphalia. I think this is the engine for innovation in global governance. Thanks, Alex. Uh, the sign's flashing that our time is up, but given that we started late, I'm going to expropriate a couple more minutes and, and, and have a couple more questions and then ask the panel in, in responding to make any closing comments. And, and the next session starts at 2.30, so we'll still have time. Uh, John Fullerton, and then one more. Yes, John. Hello. Uh, John Fullerton, Capital Institute. Um, terrific presentation, all of you. And um, one of the questions I think about a lot in this, in fact, I've set up an institute to focus on is, is how this affects finance. And one of the real thorny questions is, can we establish markets for public goods that will allow the management of these issues quickly enough and efficiently enough um, looking at the difficulty we had establishing, you know, the um, cap-and-trade system, or do we need to shift to something much more radical in terms of state involvement in the allocation of capital? 
So I'd be curious if each or if any of you have, a, have some thoughts on that. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Um, in February uh, 2009, the Secretary General of the United Nations proposed a global Green New Deal. It was a rather awkward name, but I think it was an attempt to rise to the times and still relevant for the discussions we're having today. The basic idea was to create jobs, to, to, to stimulate economic recovery and to create jobs. And the, and the green part of it was basically about two things. One, about generating sustainable energy, renewable energy, and also a second green revolution to address the, the food crisis. The other part, the, the global part, was really a call for multilateral cooperation. Unfortunately, uh, the letter uh, from the Secretary General, uh, well, not unfortunately, but he basically targeted a uh, trillion dollars as the requirement. And this was in, essentially in a letter to the leaders of the G20. Uh, that letter never was, was never released to the, uh, to the public. Uh, on the advice of uh, our lunchtime speaker yesterday, uh, because it was it would it was feared that it would raise expectations too high. But if you think about the trillion dollars which was raised by the G20, if it was deployed alternatively for uh, what might uh, for a combination of of uh, you know uh, global feed-in tariff arrangements to promote renewable energy generation and as, and into food production as well. Uh, we, we could well have seen the achievement addressing at least three, if not four, co contemporary challenges. The climate challenge, the uh, food crisis, uh, the whole question of economic recovery from this crisis and job recovery, and also arguably a development challenge. In the sense that you would put developing countries on a path of renewable energy, and we know how path-dependent uh, energy generation, can, can, energy systems can be. And this, I think, would have been a very important way forward. But I think it's still very relevant today since we are, this conference is still struggling with the aftermath of the crisis. And this particular session is attempting to see how we can promote sustainable development. Thank you. Thanks. Last question, Dan Tolley, and then to the panel. Well, there's not mic, but oh. it's a very simple question. It's a very quick question. Uh, yesterday, uh, on Friday, when we had the panel on politics and economics, I suggested there are two ways of making decisions in society. One person, one vote, and one dollar, one vote. Uh, neither of these approaches seem to be capable of responding to the sort of issues that Bill Rees is talking about. Uh, is there any hope that those two decision-making mechanisms will work, or do we actually need some kind of third decision-making mechanism beyond democracy and, and the markets? Okay, panel, there are some easy ones to wrap up on. <laughs> Which, you want to start, Alex, and then we'll... Uh, well, on John's question first, I, I certainly don't think states should be in the business of making the investment decisions and picking winners on this. I think they should create markets and then leave it to the market. I think that's what cap and trade is all about. Um, if they can create markets for um, payments for ecosystem services, um, there's a lot of this on the economics of biodiversity as well. And I think that's where they ought to be going, not, not picking winners. Um, on the global Green New Deal, I mean, I think the, the trillion dollar figure is clearly plucked from the air. It's suspiciously round. Well, it looks suspiciously round to me. Right, but I mean, what I'm getting at is what's the methodology used to reach the figure? What I, where I think there's an important point here is that we haven't really come up with an integrated price tag for sustainable development. Back at the time of the 2005 World Summit, as you'll know, Jeff Sachs uh, costed achievement of the Millennium Development Goals in low-income countries. And I think we now need to go back and do a similar exercise, but this time folding all of these environmental and climate change aspects into the mix. We didn't include climate adaptation in our estimates of how much development assistance was needed, for example. So coming up with an integrated global price tag for sustainable development and then getting into the question of where that capital will come from, I think, is absolutely crucial. And then lastly, on, on Anatol's question of one person, one vote versus one dollar, one vote, um, I mean, as I've said, I think the principle of per capita equity is really important in allocating new assets which we're creating, like tradable atmospheric property rights. But in terms of how we take decisions, um, what passes for democracy now looks to me a lot of the time like just a snapshot of disagreement. And I do think that we're getting to the point now where social networking technologies are going to allow for much more sophisticated uh, but still participative forms of decision making. 
Bill? Well, a couple of responses to this whole question of democracy and decision making. I, I think we have to, one of the things we've ignored entirely at this meeting is the whole question of power politics and the influence of vested interests in this game. Um, Alex is absolutely right. Democracy is a bit of a farce these days because we have huge money going into misinformation, the generation of ignorance at the level of the public. Uh, it's also going into lobbying uh, Congress and, and the House of Commons in Ottawa and everywhere else uh, such that, in fact, vested interests are de destroying both the market and the uh, politics uh, of democracy. So until we come to grips with the, the play of power in all of this and how it upsets both market forces, subsidies and all of those other distortions of the market are the result largely of, of corporate uh, lobbying efforts, uh, we're not really going to move very far in this game. That's uh, my short answer to that. I think in some ways it's a response to John as well. Look how difficult it is to establish basic market principles, let alone the kinds of extraordinary measures we might have to make to move us forward in the, in the kinds of directions we're talking about here. I could go on for about three hours, but I'll Just Camilla? very quickly. Nice I mean, I think on the investment allocation front, states have got a hugely powerful and important role to play in terms of giving credible, loud, long-term messages to finance markets. And I think that's what they should be focusing on. In terms of the, the, the Green New Deal, I mean, a great initiative and document and very well-timed. I hesitate to focus my attention all on money. I think that when you're looking at food production, management of water, and so on, questions like institutions, rights, and governance are at least as as important for creating incentives to invest in the productivity of those resources. On Anatol's question, it's a, a nice one, that. I mean, currently it looks to me as though it's one dollar, one vote, which is running the show. That's not working. Um, I think we should be privileging um, the votes of those people worst affected by the mess that we're making of the planet, and we should find a way of counting in the votes of future generations, too. Okay, well, let, uh, I'm sorry we left a number of hands up in the air, but we've run out of time. Clearly, we could have gone on. I hope you'll join me thanking the panel for uh, <laughs> the presentation. Thank you. <laughs>